Okay, everybody, we are here at period five, part four, the part that the entire period of history was leading up to the Civil War. So from 1861 to 1865, the United States of America was at war with itself. Our main topics all covered here and our key concepts right here. So the war really starts after Lincoln takes office and it starts at a base known as Fort Sumter. By the time Lincoln takes office, there are already seven Southern states who had seceded from the Union. Again, these are the states that were considered the Deep South. So we're talking about Alabama, Florida, Georgia, Louisiana, Mississippi, Texas, and of course, South Carolina. In Lincoln's first inaugural address, he does pledge to not interfere with slavery in the Southern states that there's no reason for secession, and more importantly, there's no right to secession. He tries to convince the South to come back into the Union with that inaugural address. One thing he does note is that Fort Sumter, a fort that is located stuck out here in the South, is running out of supplies, and it's receiving no support or help from the Southern states. So Lincoln says he's sending provisions to Fort Sumter, not reinforcements. The Confederacy ultimately attacks Fort Sumter in eight, April of 1861, and the Civil War begins. Now, the impact of that attack at Fort Sumter ultimately unites the North completely against the South. It makes them very, very much so unified against this idea of attacking the actual United States of America. So they want to preserve the Union. They want to, in some way, shape, or form, help bring the union back together. Lincoln initially just calls for volunteers to go and fight in this war. Southerners, on the other hand, rally around the Confederacy, and we see four more states join the Confederacy, Virginia, North Carolina, Tennessee, and Arkansas. You will notice on this map, though, we now have a new state, West Virginia. Virginia actually splits in the way it decides how to handle the war. West Virginia ends up becoming one of the border states, and Virginia is now a Southern Confederate state. Lincoln's priority now becomes keeping the border states part of the Union. The border states, Missouri, Kentucky, Delaware, Maryland, and again, like I said, West Virginia. All of these ultimately become the states that exist between the border, between the South and the North. The goal of Lincoln is to keep them in the Union. Why? One, if those border states were to leave the Union and to join the Confederacy, the Confederate Army would grow exponentially. Also, there is a lot of manufacturing that is going on in those states. So if the South were to get them and they would become part of the Confederacy, the Southern states would then have far more manufacturing capacity and may be able to help this war last longer. And then just geographically, it was a perfect place to be able to have sort of a buffer when it came to military invasions into the Confederacy. Now to maintain the border states was not easy. In Maryland, for example, there had to be martial law just to make sure it worked. In Missouri, even though it was considered a border state, it still had guerrilla warfare occurring in it during the Civil War. And in general, across all of those states, there was a suspension of the writ of habeas corpus which basically meant that if you were going against the Union, you could be arrested and not told why and be kept in jail indefinitely. Now for the North or the Union, their advantages were many, and a lot of it had to do with their economy. First and foremost, they had far more industrial resources than the South had. They also had railroads that were very well organized and built across both the North and the West. The Union also had a very powerful Navy and a well-established government. Their population was far larger than the Confederacy, and slaves were already emancipated there, which meant theoretically there could be a big push to bring any of the enslaved people in the South to the North to emancipate them. The disadvantages on the other side, though, were that they lacked military leadership in particular. Many of the top military leaders ultimately joined the South most famously, Robert E. Lee. 
Robert E. Lee was from Virginia and he was considered the top military general in the US. He was asked specifically by Lincoln to lead the Union Army. But when he had to make the decision between defending Virginia and the South or defending the United States of America, he ultimately sided with his state of Virginia. And when Virginia seceded from the Union, he became the top military general for the Confederate Army. The other big one was the lack of purpose. The Southern states felt unified under their fight for struggling for their independence and their defense of slavery. On the other hand, in the Union or the North, not everybody was opposed to slavery in the South, and therefore they didn't necessarily all feel the same about the purpose of the war. But when you have that kind of division, it is hard to keep a war going if you don't have enough people who support it. On the other side, the South or the Confederate states, their big advantage was the fact that they were fighting a defensive war, meaning the entire population of the South was relatively friendly. They didn't have to worry about being attacked by their own people. And since most of the major battles occurred in the South, they had that protection. They also had a sense of purpose. They knew why they were fighting. They were fighting for the defense of slavery and for their way of life. It was considered a Southern honor to fight for your Confederate states. They also had an insane number of veteran military officials who were known for their military strategy. And then finally, their expansive cotton economy allowed them to feel like they could get some assistance from places like Britain because Britain was so dependent on Southern cotton. They hoped that they would get recognition as an individual country and therefore hopefully financial assistance. The downside though, is they had no Navy, so they could be blocked relatively easily by any waterways. They had no clear government structure, even though they had elected a president, Jefferson Davis, because of their strong connection to the idea of states' rights, they never really established a strong federal government in the Confederate states. And finally, they were very poorly equipped. They had no easy transportation system because they never really had established a strong railroad system. They had a weak economy that was only based on cash crops, and they had almost no manufacturing. How does Lincoln get everybody in the North, whether they want to or not, to fight for the war? He passes a draft. In 1863, or March of 1863, Congress passes the Conscription Act and Lincoln signs it into law. What the Conscription Act is, is just a draft. All men, 20 to 45, had to register for the draft. The problem with the draft, similar to all drafts in American history, is it was very unfair, specifically to the poor because rich people could, and rich families ultimately paid off the draft and would oftentimes pay someone else to go in the place of their son or themselves. This is referred to as the $300 men substitutes where they would pay $300 for somebody to substitute them if their draft number was called. In 1863 as well, we see famously the New York City draft riots. It was a mob of mostly Irish Americans who were upset about the draft process and began to attack both wealthy people and African Americans who initially were not allowed to fight in the war. Lincoln throughout most of the Civil War proclaimed that he was not fighting the war to end slavery. He was fighting it because secession was not legal and that the Union needed to be brought back together. He needed to make sure to keep support from the border states, so he never really took a strong stand against slavery as a whole, not until almost the end of the war does he do that. He feared white workers in the North, so he wanted to seem like he didn't want it to expand, but he didn't necessarily talk about, again, the end of slavery in the South. He also had to, in some way, shape, or form, appease the Northern Democrats. So then how do we get to the Emancipation Proclamation? There are two reasons why the government ultimately considers freeing slaves. Militaristically, it makes sense because if you were to liberate all of the slaves in the South, then it would undermine the economic foundation of the entire South. Because if you were to free all of their slaves, they would no longer have a labor force. Ideologically, it was just the right thing to do, and there was an increasing amount of pressure 
to emancipate all of the slaves. A group of people that you're going to want to pay attention to, especially for the second half of period five, is this group right here known as the Radical Republicans. They were the part of the Republican Party that demanded immediate emancipation of all slaves in the United States of America. And they were led by Charles Sumner, the guy who'd been beaten by a cane, Thaddeus Stevens, and Benjamin Wade. They were constantly pressuring Lincoln to make the war about slavery, and they wanted him to immediately make slavery illegal. They were radical for a number of reasons that we'll talk more about when we get to the final video about Reconstruction. In the lead up to emancipation, there were multiple confiscation acts passed in both 1861 and 1862. For the part on Lincoln's shoulders, he really felt that the only power he had was a militaristic power. Meaning if the South was considered terrorists who were now fighting against their own country, then he had the right based off general rules of war to be able to take any of their property to help beat them in a war. So in the Confiscation Act of 1861, slaves were used for insurrectionary purposes, uh, were declared free. So in other words, if the South tried to use the slaves as a way to protect themselves from the North, then those slaves in particular would be declared free. It was an incentive to escape to Union camps for many of the slaves in the South. The second Confiscation Act was passed in July of 1862, and it freed all slaves who were enslaved by anybody engaged in rebellion against the US. Both of these acts were very difficult to enforce, seeing as most, again, most of the fighting was occurring in the South. Finally, in 1862, we start to see the creation of the actual Emancipation Proclamation. Following the Battle of Antietam, Lincoln decides to move forward with announcing the emancipation. Why wait until the Battle of Antietam? It's one of the first major victories on the side of the Union. In the end, to say it's a victory is pretty, you know, crass because of how many people actually died at Antietam. Tens of thousands of people on either side died, but ultimately it was seen as a big win for the Union and he felt it was the appropriate time to make this proclamation because he argued it was a military necessity. The Emancipation Proclamation, just to be very clear, only emancipated slaves in rebel territory, AKA the Confederate States. It did not free slaves in the border states. So all of those border states that still maintain slavery were allowed to maintain their slaves. The impact of the Emancipation Proclamation is it strengthened the moral cause of the North. It did slowly but surely convince people that the Civil War was a moral fight about ending slavery. It wasn't just about bringing the Union back together. It ultimately made it so that Europe did not want to touch the Confederacy with a 10-foot pole. Most European nations by this point had already made slavery illegal in their countries. So now that the war was about slavery, Europe refused to assist or aid the Confederacy. It gave the Union new soldiers for the Union Army because now that these this, that slaves were emancipated in the South, any slaves that were any newly emancipated Black people who were able to make it to the North could now fight in the Union Army. The limits to the Emancipation Proclamation are pretty obvious. First of all, this was coming from a Northern pres president. And ultimately there was no, Lincoln had no authority in the Confederacy. So it's not like the Southerners were just gonna be like, oh, I guess Lincoln freed all the slaves. I guess we have to give them up. It also did not apply to the border states. So it seemed very, very, very inconsequential in regards to truly ending slavery. With the Emancipation Proclamation, as well as with a strong fight from Frederick Douglass, there was a desire to see more African Americans be able to enlist in the Union Army. This would provide, hopefully, an opportunity to prove their citizenship that was clearly denied by the Dred Scott case. By allowing African Americans to fight in the military, the hope was that all white people in America, whether Northerners or Southerners, would be able to see that the people that have been enslaved in this country for so long had just as much right to be citizens in this country, especially since they were willing to fight and die for this nation. 
Over 180,000 African Americans ultimately served in the Civil War. One of the most famous regiments being the Massachusetts 54th Regiment. If you want to learn more about them, there's a great movie called Glory, um, worth watching, that goes over sort of their story. There was a lot of prejudice, though, against these particular regiments. First and foremost, they were segregated. They were all Black regiments, and they were led oftentimes by white generals. They were paid way less than the white soldiers were, and oftentimes didn't receive all of the equipment they needed to actually fight in the war. Another big issue was the fact that they weren't allowed to be promoted within the military, so they really could not move up the ranks in the military, even though they were fighting alongside all of the other soldiers. During the Civil War, one big note to pay attention to, and this isn't even just the Civil War, but during all wars. During all wars, the President of the United States of America gains more power because during the war, there needs to be a single leader sort of guiding decision making. And so whenever Congress chooses to declare war, executive power expands. Another big trend we tend to see during wars is that civil liberties are oftentimes greatly reduced during times of both national crisis and war. During his time as president during the Civil War, Abraham Lincoln famously suspended the writ of habeas corpus in both Maryland as well as many other states across the Union. He also used his presidential power to, um, to move soldiers and make decisions without the approval of Congress. He ordered blockades without approval of Congress. He increased the, increased the size of the federal army without the approval of Congress all things that were gonna to have to be paid for by the federal budget, which is controlled by Congress, but he made the decisions to do this. Lincoln, for many Southerners and many Democrats, was seen not as a great man and great leader of the Union Army, but rather as a dictator because of his extreme use of executive power. Now, politics during the war, there were challenges on either side. For the Union and for Lincoln, his big issue was the fact that the Republicans were split. There was the radical Republicans who were gaining voice and power in Congress. Those were led by a man by the name of Thaddeus Stevens. And then there were the moderate Republicans who tended to want the war to end as quickly as possible, even if it meant slavery continued. The radical Republicans were radical, as I said, for a number of reasons. First and foremost, they wanted immediate emancipation of all enslaved people, but they also wanted equal rights for those newly freed people. They wanted them to be able to vote in elections, and they wanted there to be direct support by the federal government for those people. The other big challenges that Lincoln had to face were as he had a group of war Democrats and peace Democrats in Congress. The war Democrats supported the war, but they criticized everything Lincoln did in handling it. The peace Democrats, otherwise known as Copperheads, were very oppositional to, war, oppositional to the war, and they wanted it to end immediately. They wanted a negotiated peace by any means necessary, again, even if it meant the continuation of slavery. Frequently, the Copperheads and the moderate Republicans would actually work together in Congress to oppose things Lincoln wanted to do. In 1864, Abraham Lincoln had to run for re-election during the middle of the Civil War. He ran against General McClellan, who had been the original general of the Union Army, who he fired because of his inability to make any leeway into the war. In 1864, Lincoln ultimately beats McClellan and becomes president again. The big challenges for the Confederacy, on the other hand, is the fact that they had hoped for European intervention, but Europe ultimately decided to stay out of it, especially due to the Emancipation Proclamation. Europe ultimately found other places to obtain cotton from. Most famously, um, Europe, most notably Britain, started to get its cotton from Egypt. There was also the big issue of the fact that the Confederacy had been born out of a desire for the protection of states' rights. And because of that, it made it very difficult to organize themselves. Individual soldiers fought for their state, not necessarily completely for the Confederacy. A Virginian was fighting for the freedom and rights of those people in Virginia. Somebody from South Carolina was fighting for the freedom and the rights of people in South Carolina. 
So oftentimes the desires of the individual states conflicted with the central government, making it difficult to organize anything. The Republicans though, during the Civil War had a majority in Congress and the Republican was the president. And so because of that, they were actually able to get a lot done that we oftentimes don't talk about until after the war because it's really going to impact the later half of the 1800s. All of these acts were passed by Congress during the war, and they're ultimately going to allow for the complete and total expansion and settlement of the Western territories after the war. The Morrell Tariff Act will help pay for the war and will protect Northern industries. The Homestead Act set up sale of land in the West and encouraged settlement and therefore the creation of states in the West. The Legal Tender Act printed paper money or greenbacks so that the economy in the North could continue to function. The National Bank Act was a financial landmark that sought to establish a unified banking system, very similar to what the Bank of the United States was, and will ultimately be established truly in the early 1900s. And the Pacific Railway Act, which was mostly focused on building a transcontinental railroad across the entire United States of America. All of these things are things that were debated and fought over for decades before the Civil War. And now that the Republicans had a majority in Congress, they were able to pass all of them. Ultimately, the impact of the war was that the Civil War was the deadliest war in American history. Obviously so, seeing as America was fighting America. Over 600,000 lives were lost. The Southern economy was all but completely destroyed, but the Northern industrialization greatly accelerated because of the war. Republican laws were passed without any ability by the Democrats to slow them down. The union was ultimately preserved and the ideas of secession and nullification were defeated in the sense that they were decided to be completely illegal. The Civil War was an ultimate test for American democracy and for better or for worse, America made it out of the Civil War. And in the passing of the 13th Amendment, which occurred right near the end of the war, four million slaves were freed. The war ultimately ends with the surrender at Appomattox Courthouse on April 9th of 1865. And just a few days later on April 14th, John Wilkes Booth kills Abraham Lincoln in Ford's Theater.